Hello and welcome to the Columbia Daily Tribune's Behind the Stripes webcast. This is Tribune Sports Editor Joe Waljesper along with Tribune Football Beat Writer Dave Matter. Dave, Missouri coming off a 24-17 loss at Kansas State. I think one of the main topics for debate after that game was whether Missouri was using its offensive weapons most wisely in that game. They, they scored 17 points, but two touchdowns in the, were in the fourth quarter after that point. They were really stymied, uh, in particular Henry Josie. Just maybe your thoughts on how they're using him, and is it enough? Well, everybody looks at the first quarter. Missouri only ran seven plays. Henry Josie didn't touch the ball on any of those. Actually, there was a pass to him that he dropped, mm -hmm. but it wasn't probably going to go anywhere anyway. He was kind of the outlet there. Um, you know, if you're Missouri going into this game, you have to figure you're not going to get many possessions because of Kansas State's uh, style of offense. You have to maximize those opportunities, and if Josie is your best player, which he clearly has been on offense, mm -hmm. most electric, dynamic player, uh, why not get him more involved earlier on? Only three of those first seven plays were second and long or third and long where you would think, okay, it's probably not a good idea to run the ball. But they had plenty of opportunities, you know, during that game before it sort of got out of hand, before it was 24 to 3, mm -hmm. where they could have, um, you know, given him the ball more often, I think. It's, it's easy to second guess, but uh, if you're Missouri, you know, a, a Josie run these days is, you're, is about as good on average as a pass mm -hmm. completion. So, uh, why not get him involved more than just I think he had 12 carries for the game, which is about what he's averaging for the season. Uh, but again, you look at the at the Big 12 rushing list. He's he's still the top rusher. He still has a top yards per carry average. But he's just they're just not getting uh, as many opportunities for him to to run the ball. Yeah, I think they're maybe a little bit fearful of him getting hurt because I know when we asked Gary Pinkle this week, he said he only wanted to get him about 15 carries a game and then five pass receptions for a total of 20, although I don't know that they've ever thrown the ball five no. times to a running back, so I'm not sure where that number comes from. But it seemed odd in that game, too. They, I think Kendall Lawrence had a carry before Josie yeah. did, and Kendall was running backwards for most of the day, so it really is a little baffling to me. I think sometimes David Yost overcomplicates things when you got a guy like Josie. It's not, you know, with the receiver, it can be a little complicated how do you get in the ball with a running back. It's really not and I'm a little bit baffled as yeah, to why. He, he has a minor hamstring injury, but it didn't seem to bother him. I think he had a 36-yard run or 22-yard run in, in that game and, and was really just, uh, they were moving the chains pretty easily when they finally made mm -hmm. a little bit of a commitment to give him the ball. But then they went into their hurry-up mode where they just go with five wide receivers. They actually take him out of the game. Missouri moved the ball at that point, but, but David Yost actually admitted on Monday that it had more to do with, or just as much to do with K-State's defense. They were in a prevent defense and were kind of giving Missouri those completions. Um, so that's what provided the comeback, but maybe they wouldn't have needed a comeback if they could have given him the ball a little bit more earlier. All right, Missouri is now 2-3. and three. Their three losses have been on the road to ranked teams, so not maybe not a bad loss in the bunch, but the fact that they are 2-3, and three, Maybe what's the realistic host for this team now? Because there are a bunch more ranked teams on the schedule. Well, if you just look at the schedule, I mean, there's two obvious games they should win. They should have no excuse for losing, and that Saturday is against Iowa State, um, and then the last game of the year at Kansas. After that, I think you got one game that's really going to be tough, and even though it's at home, the following week, Oklahoma State, I mean, they're putting up 50, 60 points up regularly, and they scored 56 at halftime against Kansas mm -hmm. last week. And, and the way Missouri's played pass defense, uh, you got to think that would be a tough game. For Missouri to win. After that, you've got, I think, four kind of toss-up games, and, and if Missouri doesn't play well, I don't know if any of these games are really a toss-up. They, they, at home, they have Texas and Texas Tech. Never beaten Texas under Gary Pinkle. Um, lost at Texas Tech a year ago. And then you go on the road to Baylor and Texas A&M, two teams that can be pretty potent on offense. So I don't think there's a guaranteed win there by any means. So if you just if you do what you're supposed to do against Iowa State, Kansas, lose to Oklahoma State, and then split those toss-up games, you're looking at six and six. And I don't think anybody envisioned that going mm -hmm. into the season. I think it speaks to how difficult the Big 12 is more than anything that a, a decent team like Missouri, I think we'd agree they're probably a decent team, uh, is going to have that tough of a time being over 500. True. Yeah, I think six and six might be kind of a lofty goal at this point. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, when I look at Missouri. I don't see much improvement from the game. And his teams usually improve, and they're still making the dumb, dumb penalties. I think if you want to pick out one play that could really turn that game Saturday, it's when they rough the punter. Yeah. You know, yes, it's it's troubling that Grant Russell is missing all these field goals, but I think you got to be tough enough to to not just suddenly lose your mind and panic when that happens. And I. I think they kind of did on that drive after the second missed field goal. They right. left the punter. They jump off sides. They kind of start going for big hits in the backfield instead of wrapping up. And then now you're you really are in trouble. Before the drive starts, you're only down seven. Right. And right. at the end, you know, if you just kind of keep your head at that point, 
you end up making the comeback, maybe you would have had a chance to win the game. Yeah, you're seeing veteran players make these mistakes, and this is this was their third, fourth year playing a lot of minutes, and it seems like they're trying to win every game on each play. You know mm-hmm. that they're prop- they're so unaccustomed to losing. Maybe they're just getting a little desperate. They're getting reckless out there and doing things that a Gary Pinkle coach team usually doesn't do, the jumping off sides, the personal fouls, a lot of false starts on offense so far. So um, those are things that you'd think would be you know, easily correctable because it, it's just a matter of playing with some poise, but it, it just won't stop. It's weird because the previous two years, they really had a pretty young team. This year they don't. You know, last year... Uh, in the preseason, we were all questioning Missouri's discipline because they were getting arrested right and left. This year, they've had no problems that way, but this really has turned out to be an undisciplined football team on the yeah, field. Yeah. So anyway, I, don't, I hadn't gotten better yet, but I guess we're not even halfway through the season. Um, Iowa State coming up this week, they began the season on a good note. They beat Iowa at home. They go to UConn and win. They had one of the tougher non-con schedules in the Big 12, and they won them all. Since the conference play started, they got blown out at home against Texas. Got beat pretty bad at Baylor. Is this the kind of team you think that could upset Missouri? They're, they're usually competitive under Paul Rhodes. This is his third year now. They're, they're a physical team. They're not overly talented. You know, they went down and beat Texas last year in Austin, which everyone did. But still, that, that took something to be able to do mm-hmm. that. They played Nebraska really tough a year ago. Um, you know, the Iowa game you mentioned. Uh, so I think they're, they're capable of doing some good things. But if you just look at their numbers for the season so far compared to everybody else in the Big 12, this is not a team that does anything particularly very well. I mean, they're not very explosive on offense. Uh, they haven't really shut anybody down on defense in, in any facet of the game. They turn the ball over a lot. They're the worst team in the Big 12 as far as turnover margin goes. And they're actually, believe it or not, committing more penalties than Missouri. So mm-hmm. it's a team that makes a lot of mistakes. Uh, and, and Missouri absolutely has to capitalize on those mistakes and, and kind of do what K-State did to Missouri. And, and I think the Tigers should be able to win this game. But you can't match you know, Iowa State's sloppiness. I mean, you, you can't play down to their level if they're going to play like they have the last two weeks against Texas and Baylor. Mm-hmm. Lastly, um, in the realignment game, two kind of important things to come out this week. Um, number one, uh, the Associated Press got their hands on an internal document that Missouri's curators looked at when they were meeting last week. Um, and in it, kind of the juicy item was Missouri's projection that if they were to go to the SEC, they would make um, somewhere in the range of 19 to 29 million dollars, 12, 12 million more at the high end um, than they would have in the Big 12. Um, so that's one thing. Then the second thing is uh, on a conference call, Chuck Nina says that even if Missouri were to leave, um, it would not be for 2012. Yeah. Just your reaction to those things, if you think there's much validity to either the money projection or the right. Ninus comment? Well, as far as Ninus goes, it, it, you know, Missouri isn't responding to any of this one way or the other. He seems to know that, and, mm-hmm. and maybe if he can put that out there, that he expects Missouri to be in the Big 12 in 2012, um, maybe it's a little bit of posturing, and, and maybe he's just trying to um, portray this as, a, as that's a given, that Missouri isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I think, though, you have to be kind of skeptical listening to him say that. Why would that be the case if they are intent on leaving eventually? Why would you assume that um, Missouri isn't on the same path as at Texas A&M as far as paying some settlement fees or, and, uh, and, and leaving the Big 12 at the same time? I don't, I don't know what the difference is unless he just kind of figures that if he says that, um, you know, maybe that just gives the impression that, that Missouri is, is thinking about staying, even though we really got no indication that they that they are lately. So I'm not really sure how to interpret that. It is weird that they're not denying it, though. It's like I've tried and tried and tried to get some sort of clarification. They're just saying that Brady Eaton won't comment on it. Right, right. It seems like if it was something that was erroneous, they would want to comment on it and say it was erroneous. And maybe at this point it, they're not sure if it's erroneous. I mean, I think they're <laughs> probably still in those negotiation phases with, with the Big 12 that um, maybe a decision hasn't been made. I mean, it's really hard to tell at this point because things have gotten so quiet. And you can read into that, um, you can read into that, those no comments one of two ways. Either that means that they're on the verge of leaving, or maybe they just don't know. Mm-hmm. And lastly, as far as the money situation, um, I actually did a little work on that topic, and it sounded like from the people I talked to in the TV business that the $12 million figure is quite a bit out there, like on the far end of what mm-hmm. might be possible. Just not, not because the SEC is not a really valuable commodity, but because it's so early in a 15-year contract. Um, and so essentially... You can't just go tear it up and start a new one. You're having to work with ESPN and CBS with what you currently have. So 
I don't know, people I've talked to said you'd probably get an incremental increase over what the SEC teams are getting now, and they're now getting about 18 million per school, so you would bump that up a little, but it would not be an enormous jump. Right. Um, now, down the line, it might be, you know, when in 2024, when they get to work up a whole new deal, then yeah, maybe then, but I think until then, I, everyone I've talked to seem to think that 12 million more than they would make the Big 12 is, is way over the top. You know, I, I think maybe there's a chance that really Missouri's. Um, that their basis for leaving is more based on these, these issues of trust and relationships and the stability and less about the pure raw numbers and maybe they're just kind of throwing these numbers out to their curators which I don't think they intended to be shared with publicly right. um, to, to kind of be the uh, here, here's here's a reason to give you a pause on staying in the Big 12 and see what's out there but the real reasons are, are these issues that we're having with the other members specifically Texas and just how the league is, is set up uh, come the structural issues that we've talked about before, that you can't really plan uh, long-range facility, uh, you know, plans because of that lack of stability. So I think those are the core of the issues, and, and these numbers are just maybe trying to uh, convince some people that, that don't that want to see some numbers. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks for joining us again this week. Next week we'll be back to talk about the Iowa State game and maybe more realignment. Today.